let's summarize the reactions of alkynes that we've seen in this lesson and the last. The first involves proton transfer, and the fact that in the presence of a strong enough base, something whose conjugate acid typically has a pKa of 30 or more, we can deprotonate the terminal alkyne proton to give an acetylide anion. This proton transfer step is an important prelude to nucleophilic substitution reactions at the anionic carbon. While only terminal alkynes are capable of that deprotonation, terminal or internal alkynes can engage in the second general reaction type, which is electrophilic addition to the alkyne pi bond. This is analogous to the corresponding process in alkenes and may give rise to alkenal or vinyl cation intermediates or avoid carbocations through concerted mechanisms. Essentially, every reaction we've looked at so far of alkynes can be thought of either as involving this proton transfer event or as an electrophilic addition process. There are a couple that fall outside of this mold, such as hydrogenation and ozonolysis, but in general, this is the right way to think about how alkynes react. The map on this slide shows us eight different reactions of alkynes and the products that they lead to. One thing we haven't yet discussed is how to synthesize alkynes from other functional groups. We've seen previously that alkenes can be synthesized through elimination, and alkynes can likewise be synthesized through the elimination of a vicinal dihalide like this. In two sequential elimination steps, HX is first eliminated to form an alkenal halide, and then a second equivalent of HX is eliminated to form the alkyne product. When a terminal alkyne is the desired product, it's important to use three equivalents of the base. This is because the base will spontaneously deprotonate the terminal alkyne as it's formed. So we need to use enough to ensure that all of the terminal alkyne can be deprotonated and we have enough base left over to affect both eliminations. Even the production of an internal alkyne through this method requires two equivalents of base to affect the two eliminations. The purpose of NH4Cl in the second step is really, you can think of it as a workup step, to protonate the acetylide anion and give the neutral terminal alkyne product. Reaction A is the deprotonation of a terminal alkyne with strong base such as NaNH2, followed by treatment with an alkyl halide, and this leads to substitution of the terminal alkyne. Reaction B is hydrohalogenation, and this leads to more substituted alkenal halide products when we avoid the formation of radicals through the strict use of HX only. A second round of addition here produces a geminal 1,1 dihalide product. When we use conditions that promote the formation of radicals along with HX, we get the anti-Markovnikov or less substituted alkenal halide product, and a second addition here produces a vicinal or 1,2 dihalide product. Hydroboration of a terminal alkyne gives an aldehyde through an anti-Markovnikov process, while acid-catalyzed hydration gives an internal carbonyl compound, or a ketone. Keep in mind that both of these involve tautomerization of an intermediate enol to the more stable carbonyl isomer, or keto form. Ozonolysis of an alkyne produces carboxylic acids, or in the case of a terminal alkyne, CO2. And these reaction conditions involve treatment with ozone, followed by or simultaneously with the introduction of water. Simple hydrogenation with H2 and a palladium or platinum catalyst gives rise to alkanes. But if we wish to stop this hydrogenation early, we need to use different reaction conditions. Use of H2 and Lindlar's catalyst gives rise to a cis alkene product, while the use of dissolving metal conditions, sodium metal and liquid ammonia, gives rise to the trans alkene product. As I've shown it here, because we're going from a terminal alkyne whether the cis or trans product forms is irrelevant, but keep in mind these conditions in general.